Hi everyone, welcome back to NIPS, the podcast. I'm your host, Milanist. And I'm your host, Paul Antonio. And this is where we discuss everything about calligraphy, lettering, and sign painting, and other stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so last week, we, we were talking about certification and stuff like this. Where we, Do you remember where did we finish talking about? I think yes. about your certification. So we were talking about my certification, but I, I, I just had to look this up. And the European Lettering Institute is actually in Belgium, oh. not in Denmark. <clears throat> okay. Fair so, enough. So my, my certification, you know, when you study, when you come on a lecture with me, I take you through the paleographical side of things because I, I don't think that we should be teaching people without giving them historical context. I think, but there is nobody else who is teaching polygraphic stuff, right? I think, I mean, I, you're the only person that I ever well, heard not, even talking not about. Not in a calligraphic context. I mean, there are paleography courses, but they are generally geared to people studying manuscript history rather than calligraphers. Mm -hmm. So in my courses, we, in order to do a course, this is, this is how we're sort of planning this. The lecture is essential because I, I see no point in you wanting to learn a script if you don't know about the script. The reason for this is there are variations to the script that once you learn it, you might find one of the variations actually more interesting for you than the base script. My certification is based around my fourfold symmetry and I'm being really specific here with, as it's my certification. Of course. It's a key ascribed certification based on the structure of the letters using the fourfold symmetry, which works initially starts with geometry. Because I don't think that teaching students a complex script without giving them a ge geometric construct to build a script onto is a worthwhile practice. Hmm. So for instance, you do the, the lecture, then we have a workshop. So the workshop introduces you to the script. It's a masterclass. And then we have these things called catch-up classes. And the catch-up classes are an hour on each group. So we look at the INMUVW then LTJHY and O C E O A E C D G Q, uh, And so you're looking at the letters in the groups that they work with for an hour in real detail. And then, um, and then we look at how to put the letters together into words, sentences, and paragraphs. We look at numbers, punctuation, diacriticals, and we look at flourishing. Mm -hmm. And we also look at things like, you know, how to use the same script with different tools. So if, you're, if you've learned italic, most people think italic is a, a broad edge nib script. Or well, you can do it with a pointed nib. Yeah, you, you can do it, but does this make it pointed uh, pen script or what? What is it when actually? I, when I teach italic, what I do is, I, so I, I always tell my students, my copper plate students, don't throw away your nibs. I mean, obviously not a G nib, you know, these are like Chillot 303s or, or 122 bs so when the tip wears away, I always keep my nibs and I have a, a pair of pliers, really sharp cutters, wire cutters, and I just snip the tip off. So I make a pointed, flexible nib into a little broad edge nib. So I can get a little bit of pressure on that nib, but I also have that edge to play with. But how much do you cut off? Is it like a centimeter or like oh, two? No, it's not a centimeter. It's probably half a millimeter okay. off the tip. So you get a little broad edge nib. So, but, but you can also do italic with a pointed brush. You could do it with a filamented brush or a spongy tip brush. It, it, you're using the understanding of the script to create text, but written with a different tool. So that, that's, some, that's something as a week. Yes, yes. <laughs> so, and then of course you have the homework. Now, because it's my calligraphic script I'm teaching you, mm -hmm. I can certify it because I've developed it. So my P scribe geometric, my P scribe textualis quadrata, I always tell people is not an historical script. It's a geometric construct that I developed to help students who want to learn any Gothic script to have a jumping off point. So I can certify it because I developed it. But I am not going to give you a certificate until you actually are able to do what I expect you to do with my script. 
So uh, how much so time usually does it take for this to happen? Like for, okay, let's say I'm somebody totally new. I come to your classes, lectures, whatever. How much time do I need in order to get to the point where I'm able to get your certificate? Approximately. I, I, would, think, I would think the certification should take about a year. Wow. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to let you go off there saying, oh, I'm doing the PScribe Textualis Quadrata and it's not. <laughs> You're crazy. I'm not going to let somebody ruin my name like that. So, so the certification process for me is very rigorous because you know what? I, I didn't have a lot of money when I was growing up and I had to work hard to win scholarships, to go to university, to study my craft and to be as good as I am. So mm. you can't just think that you're going to come along and then magic it up and it'll be fine. There has to be a rigorous system in place to make sure that when you go out there to teach it, that you're actually teaching people the right thing. So that, that's my certification. There are other people running certification programs. Um, and you just have to be conscious of how the certification program runs. And I would suggest you get samples of students' work, you look at the work, you make sure you understand what they're going to teach you. I mean, there is one certification program that I saw online and then I saw some of the students work and I wrote to the Institute offering it. And I said, I don't know what you think calligraphy is, but whatever it is, you think it is, it is not because this stuff that you're teaching people is wrong. You cannot give somebody a certificate telling them that they can have a certificate in calligraphy and this is what they leave with. That is, that is, that is wrong. <laughs> so certification is, you know, I, 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 I'm a little bit rigid about certification because I had to work hard to get my distinctions. Now, whether or not you want certification is another matter. Whether or not you need it is yet another matter. Yeah. Okay, that's so what, what I was about to ask. Like it's 2021, like, do you actually need a certificate? And if you get one, where can you use it actually? I mean, what, what can you use for such a certificate? Well, but let's, let's, go back to the, let's go back to the certification for plumber or electrician. They have to be certified. Okay. And you know that if they are certified, they have a certain level of understanding, responsibility, and, and knowledge for their, for their trade. We don't have that with calligraphy. So, so if you just want to pick up a pen and call yourself a calligrapher and say you're teaching italic and you're not teaching italic, there, there's nothing to stop you from, from lying to people. Now, I, I say lying to people, but you know, I, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a little bit, this for me is a very sore topic. Mm -hmm. You might be teaching what you think is italic because nobody's ever taught you correctly. So you're happy to mess up other people's idea of what italic is because you don't actually know what it is yourself. That for me is a problem. That for me is actually a big problem. Hmm. Now, let's, let's, let's step back a little bit. Do you need to be certified to do calligraphy? Probably not. Most people do calligraphy because they enjoy it. You know, they enjoy the practice. You know, for them, it's, it's not about becoming a certified calligrapher. It's about using the practice to help, to help relax them, to help, you know, you know, just take a break from work as, as something to focus, something else to focus on. You might have nice handwriting and you just formalize it a little bit and you write out some poems to some people and you write some letters and that kind of thing. And you know what? That's fine. But you are not, you're not a trained calligrapher. So, if you start teaching, you need to make sure that you're teaching the right thing. This is where the certification, this is where I get a little bit sort of frustrated with the lack of certification because, you know, I've seen so many, I, I, Milan, I can't tell you how many students have come to me having gone on courses with other people and said, oh, this is what I was taught. And I'm like, oh, oh my goodness, how much money did you pay for this? And what really gets me angry is you are taking somebody's hard earned money and you are not teaching them what they're supposed to be learning. That for me is a problem because technically you're stealing from that person. 
You know, there's very few people who look about it like you do, because uh, we've spoken before about this. There are people who, who are into calligraphy a few months and they start teaching and it's it's something we cannot control and it's something that a lot of people will keep abusing, you know? But, so, but this, is, this is where, you know, it sort of comes, the, the fault is, you can't just lay the fault at the teacher. You have to kind of lay part of the fault at the student as well, because you don't just go somewhere and go, oh, I want to learn this. And any fool who tells you, yeah, I could teach you that, you go with them. You, you need to spend the time doing some research. What do you want to learn? What script do you want to learn? Who is probably the best at it? And you look, you look at the scripts and you might not know how to compare them, but you must be able to see the difference between something that's sloppy and something that's accurate. That's totally not true, Paul. Come on. Oh, you're kidding. No, look, I interact with people which they, they know what I do. They, they like what I do. But as, as soon as I ask them, okay, can you read this? They're like, oh, like this, this looks beautiful, but I cannot read it. And imagine, imagine you're somebody who just finds calligraphy, doesn't know anything about it, doesn't know scripts, doesn't know anything. But, you know, you're like, okay, this, this is like, cool, I want to do it. There is no way that all the things you're saying, you have to, res they don't know what to research even, you know? But if you do a search for calligraphy online, you will be able to see a range of different scripts. If but you decide that you like Fracture, as you do, as I do, if you decide that you like Fracteur and you look to a search for Fracteur, right? Because it'll come up. Somebody will say Fracteur, right? You know, On that whole no... screen, somebody will say Fracteur. But there's so much things that came, come up on Google or whatever. You just write Fracteur, there come, can show up things that are even not a Fracture, but they'll show up because of keywords and uh, online I, I, stuff. I, I agree, but if you are serious about learning, you need to spend the time doing the research. Mm. No, you, yeah, you know, I you, perfectly understand what you, what you mean. You have to take responsibility for your own learning. This is not about the teacher, this is about you. If you really want to learn that script, take the time online. You know, when I started learning calligraphy, there was no internet. <laughs> so, you have this massive resource in front of you. And what you do, you send somebody who's busy, some stupid message going, I want to learn this, blah, blah. You don't even say, hi, my name is so-and-so. I want Please, to learn calligraphy. Can you help me? You know, I like your work. None of that. You just demand to know something. Instead of sitting down and going, okay, you know what? I'm going to take some time and do some research. And okay, so there's this word calligraphy. And how does it work? And, I really like it, but oh, I like this script. Oh, what's this called? Because this is different to this. You know, it doesn't take rocket science to figure out the two things are different. And all you have to do is go down that rabbit hole, click, 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 and you'll see, oh, this is brush lettering. Oh, this is, oh, okay. Oh, it's brush lettering. Go onto Instagram, search brush lettering. You see tons of people doing brush lettering and you go, oh, I like this one. And then you send a message saying, oh, hi, my name is so-and-so. I'm sorry to trouble you. Um, I really like your work. I was just wondering, how do I start with this? You know what? We will, any calligraphy teacher, any calligrapher will help you if you start a message like that. But if you start a message demanding information without any kind of, 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 um, of, of sort of, without being, you know, without introducing yourself, without any kind of decorum, you, you just annoy people because we're not here for you to demand our time and knowledge. I'm happy to help you, but you you need to show some kind of, you know, I can't even think of the word now. <laughs> you, you, need, you need to be a little bit more careful with the way you approach people. So anyway, let's get back to the certification. Now. Certification, we have like two minutes. So okay. make the so, best of it. Okay, well, <laughs> make the best of it. <laughs> well. Okay, well, maybe we'll, we'll pick up on this in a little bit again. Yeah, guys, you know, we, like this is the second episode we speak about this. I think we've mentioned enough things. To be honest, I don't know if so you know our days. There's, there's, there's a little bit more to talk about this. Um, let's, let's sort of pick up in the next episode about whether or not you need it, 
why you might not need it mm -hmm. and and you know why you think why you think you might need it because those are very different questions yeah so what's the next topic we're gonna talk about because let, 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 let's let's get through this and finish this topic okay go on okay so so after some heated debate about certification <laughs> Let, let's sort of talk about you and why you think you need to be certified. And I think this is a really important thing, you know. Very few of my students ask me for certi certification. There are some students who ask for it, and I don't really understand why they need it. It might be that you need it as a professional development certificate, um, or it might be that you just like collecting certificates. <laughs> <laughs> what? Um, but, is, this, is this one a thing? <laughs> uh, really. But the upshot is the reason why you might want certification is because of the tutor ensuring that you can actually continue the information and accuracy embedded in this particular script. If somebody tells you they're going to offer you a certificate in calligraphy in six months, that person is lying because calligraphy is a massive topic. They might be able to certify, help you get certification in one script, but they certainly cannot give you a certificate for calligraphy because <laughs> you know you have hundreds of scripts to learn in six months. So be conscious of that. The next thing about certification is when you do certification, you're basically learning the script, what the script is, how to produce it accurately, because you might want to teach it. There are lots of calligraphers out there, and I mean some absolutely brilliant calligraphers who are not certified. They don't have certificates. But what they do have is an accurate understanding of the script, what they do, and how teaching what they do can help somebody find their own path in, in, in the craft of calligraphy. So don't think that, you know, you're sort of hunting for certification because, you know, you have to have it. Lots of, lots of teachers, lots of very, very good calligraphers are not certified and they don't have certificates because for them, they are conscious and they are highly cognizant of the fact that their aim is to share correct information about the craft. Their aim is to help people like you get better rather than just producing sloppy work and shoving it out there and saying, well, this is this. Just remember, you know, those of you listening to this, you know, if you have a following, you also have a responsibility. So if there are people following you, you have to be responsible for what you're posting. So if you're telling them something is italic and it's not italic, you're only confusing your followers. If you are not sure what that script is, then leave a post saying, oh, I think this is this, or this is my version of this. So that people following you, they, you know, they have a little bit of direction. You might also want to say, I would suggest if you want to learn this script, you, you might want to follow this person or this person. So when it comes to certification, you know, be aware of why you want a certificate. Be aware of if it's necessary and be aware of if the person you want to learn from is certified to give you a certificate. Because if somebody just prints, you know, you could go onto, onto the internet and download a certificate. If somebody just prints that off for you, you know, well, what are you paying for? what are you what are you throwing money behind because and is is that certificate they're providing is it worth the money that you are going to pay to get that certification mm -hmm. is it applicable what you're going to learn you know don't 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 just sort of assume that because it's an institute that they know what they're teaching be well, they don't be responsible for your own learning rather than coming away from it saying, oh, I paid this much money and I didn't get what I wanted. You got a certificate, but you didn't get the practical training. 
So there's, I, I think there's a lot around this topic that really needs to be discussed. Last week, we were talking about brush pens and especially about uh, how you can dip them. Then let's continue talking about this. Okay, so the, the aim of this topic is to try and help beginners understand which brush pens to use. Mm -hmm. Now, the next thing to understand is what happens to the tip when you write? Because this is a closed system and you could sort of take it with you wherever you're going, you can just write practically anywhere. You could go to a coffee shop or a restaurant or something and write. The problem is the surface. These spongy tip brush pens, the tips, if you write with them on a rough surface, it basically is like writing with them on sandpaper. Remember, paper is quite textured on a micro level. It's made up of lots of troughs and peaks. So when you're writing, the, the roughness of the paper will basically start to abrade the tip, making it become fluffy and fuzzy. So your lettering won't be sharp and your hairlines will not be hairlines anymore. They'll be slightly thicker. You know, I discovered this the hard way. I had yeah. some, I had some Ecolin brush pens and they got destroyed. And when the guys from Karin sent me those, I think I was speaking with Snooze one and he told me about the surface. I, I never thought about it. And he was like, you know, Karin, there has no problem. I was like, what? Are you sure? If they're destroyed, how, how they have no problem? This doesn't smell good, by the way. <laughs> and the Karen brush tips are really good. You know, I, I've spoken to Karen about. I, I did a. You, and you, you, did you did you share did you share a video that I did? Yes, yes, you shared a video that I did with their with their oh. brush pens. And when I use a brush pen, I you know when I use a brush pen, the first thing I don't do is not the first thing you would do. When you use a brush pen, the first thing you do is you write your name. <laughs> But, you know, you're sort of attacking the brush pen. When I use a brush pen for the first time, I test to see what is the finest line, where do I feel the resistance in the tip so I know not to press too hard, what are the thickest lines I can get without going past the, 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 the highest expression of resistance in the tip. So, you know, I test the tool before I try it out because... If you try it out before you test it, you can damage it, and then it doesn't really do what it's supposed to do. I'm doing this as well. How, how can you say, oh, the first thing you can do is writing your name? It's not. I'm just not. What? Have you written your name? Have you written Calligraphy Masters, or have you written your name with the brush pen in the I first write... 10 minutes? Well, but of course. But... Answer, answer the question. <laughs> yes, but, but listen, listen, listen. Like... Even if I'm not recording this, of course I, I need to see what kind of strokes I can achieve. I'm not gonna open the panel. Okay, Milan, Milanese. But, but a lot of people do that. That's the first thing they do. They don't look at what the tool can do. They just go at it. Mm -hmm. So that damages the tip. So when you actually come to the point where you figured out how the tool works, it can't do what it's supposed to do because you, you probably destroyed it. Hmm. Now, I'm, I'm very conscious of people wasting money. You, know, if you buy an expensive tool and you ruin it, that is your own stupid fault. If you buy an expensive tool and you take your time to figure out, oh, so the tool can do this, then you're being conscious about the fact that you have just spent your hard-earned money on that tool. Figuring out what the tool can do before you just attack it really helps you to understand how to how to allow the tool to manage its longevity. But if you just jump in and you start writing with it and you don't really understand what it can do, you're probably going to just, you might as well just throw your money down the drain. What, what, what do you consider expensive tool, Paul? What? What do you consider an expensive tool? Because Milan, uh, to be honest with you, I consider all tools expensive because I uh, okay, I know you. Ha you didn't have, well, of course. Like I know this stuff, but when when I when I there are instances where where I am in a class, and I will soon I'll be teaching, and I'll say to the student, "Oh, do you have this?" And they'll say, uh, "No, I, I I don't have this." 
I'm like, oh, okay. And I've met students who really cannot afford tools. And, you know, when, when I say really cannot afford tools, you know, I get messages from people saying, oh, I, you know, do you have any spare this or spare that? You know, can you, is there, you know, I, I don't mind sending somebody a tool because I have lots of them. Mm -hmm. But what I will not do is I will not pay for the postage because. <laughs> oh, that's smart. That's, that's a whole other, that's a whole other set of problems. And, and I, you know, when you came to see me, how much did you leave with? Uh, not much. I mean, not much yeah. because like I, a little case. <laughs> yes, I couldn't take much. But Paul was like, "I have those boxes. Take this, this, take this." I was like, "I cannot take them." <laughs> so you know, it's not you know for me, comparatively speaking, I, I don't really see the cost of a tool because invariably, if I want to, if I, if I need a tool, I just call the company up and I say, "Can I get this?" And they go, "Yeah, yeah, yeah we'll send it to you." Because they know I'm going to test it, they know I'm going to put it through its paces, and I will tell them, I will give them some, you know, a really serious critique on their tool, or I will share it on my on my feed. But, you know, tools are expensive. So yeah. don't, don't don't just waste your money. And, you know, if you no. can afford tools, you know, I'm happy for you, but lots of people can't. So anyway, let's go back to that. I want to speak next episode about prices of the tools, because they're like fountain pens, which like that's i consider really expensive there are some crazy things and i that i think we will speak about i am it. not the best person to ask that question why you don't use fountain pens i no. i very rarely use fountain pens so you don't know anything about fountain pens no but nick pang does you should speak Ooh. to nick he's great well we, we can invite it we invite him in an episode i don't know this guy how can... okay I'll, I'll, I'll send him a message okay let's anyway see. So for you beginners starting off, the main thing to understand is do not try and write small. It is a waste of time and a waste of money on tools and paper and, you know, and just ink if you're using ink. Because when you write small, you're making such little movements, you don't get to see the mistakes. But you yeah, just said yeah. that the Tombow, you shouldn't write more than six millimeters now. Don't write small. So six millimeters is, yeah, I'm telling you about the Tombow. I didn't tell you to use it as a beginner. Okay. Oh, my bad. My bad. <laughs> so I would suggest you write with a bigger tool like the, uh, the, the brushable from Zig or the um, Tombow ABT, which is their, their bigger brush tip. So Tombow have, oh, I wonder if I have this handy. Is it a Tombow? Oh, yeah, that's a Tombow. So that's the Tombow ABT. So that's that's a fairly large tip as well. Um, but again, be careful with the paper because Tombow, Tombow have their own pads, which are very smooth so that they don't damage the tips. Now you can use marker pads. I wouldn't suggest you use layout paper because it's a little bit coarse and do not use tracing paper because it's very very coarse when it comes to the brush tip how about glossy paper sorry how about glossy paper so glossy paper works uh, it, th this is where the trade-off is if you're writing on glossy paper the tip can slip around a little bit and then you you don't have enough traction so it, it's really about balancing this and um, there are other brush pens by people like sharpie and um and Stabilo and uh, Zebra. So they all have, you know, sizable tips that you can use. You just have to test them out first. Those brush pens, the, the larger tipped ones, they tend to work best at about three millimeters for the X height. So if you're writing an O or an M, you might find two to three, two to three centimeters. You might find two to three centimeters is, is the size you want to work at. As a beginner, you're really desperate to write small. I would suggest some of the Kurotaki brush pens like the uh, the Zig, not the Cambio, the Zig Bimoji range. They have a nice set of medium sized tips. Um, or if you're really, really keen to write small, use the Pentel Touch. Uh, and, and of course, there are Kurotaki brush pens that are that comparable comparable size 
but they tend to work a little bit bigger. I, I, if I'm using a pencil touch, I would probably write at six to eight millimeters. If you want to go smaller, go to the Tombow Fudan Suki, and then you can take that down to four to six millimeters. Just remember the smaller you write, the harder it is to see the mistakes. Um, if you're using finger, and, and then this, this comes into the next, the next part of it is, you need to be conscious of if you're using finger movement for the writing, or if you're using wrist or whole arm movement. So finger movement is just that, wrist movement is this, and whole arm movement is that. So of course, I use whole arm movement for small writing as well, because it gives me more control, and if I have a flourish, I actually can produce the flourish with a whole arm movement, uh, mm -hmm. or, a, or a majuscule. You do the whole majuscule with the whole arm movement, not just that. Once you start using your fingers like this, the, the letters become very coarse. They become really rough. Um, there's a lot more shaking in the in the lines. Uh, so, so understanding whole arm muscular movement and whole arm movement is really critical for this kind of thing. Well, it's critical for all kinds of clinical. All right, so. So that's 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 sort of you know that that should give you a, a really good starting point if, if you're a beginner and you want to start off with brush pens. But remember, you need smooth paper. Glossy paper works, but not photo paper because that's way too glossy. Uh, the Tombow uh, brush pen pad that works really well. It doesn't just work with the Tombow brush pens; it works with all of the brush pens. Um, marker paper works well but make sure it's not too textured um and of course you know with the larger brush pens like the uh, tombow uh, abt and the zig brushable you can also dip those in ink and write with them so that's great if you want to play with color of course i didn't really talk about the ecoline brush pens that's a great range as well but you need the paper to be smooth because it really eats away at the tip um, and of course, the Ecoline brush pens work really well with Ecoline ink, so you could get some really great color blending. Okay. Yeah, that's it on this topic, guys. There is always much more that we can speak about. Uh, there is also a great article on lettering daily. Uh, if I remember, I will leave a link in the description. Okay, so let's let's finish this topic. Okay, guys. Last week we started speaking about uh, earning. What was it? <laughs> Wait. Turning your hobby into a profession. Yeah, and this is going to continue into a few more episodes. As last time Paul explained, this is a bit of a bigger topic. And last time we finished speaking that creating products came out of suffering, same as I did with the calligraphy masters. And yeah, let's see. You can continue talking if you remember where we left, Paul. Okay, so, so last time we were talking about the fact that if you take your hobby and you turn it into a profession, you'll need another hobby. And I was saying how for me, I, I, I'm lucky enough that I have such a broad understanding of calligraphy that I could compartmentalize my hobby. So the work I did for clients was client based work. I love doing research in illuminated manuscripts and writing master copy books and going to libraries and that's still calligraphy. And it feeds into my profession because the knowledge I gain will help me with my teaching. But the research is, is, is amazing. I love it. I love going to a museum or to a library and say, oh, can I see this? And they bring out a book from sort of, you know, from the eighth century and they hand it to you and you're just like, <laughs> so, so that for me is, that is how I compartmentalized my hobby. Um, because that, that research is, 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 that brings me a lot of joy. And I get to share that research with my followers and, and my students because it, it then feeds into my work. Turning it into a passion is, so, uh, so in the last episode, we talked about different options and, and, and how you can use calligraphy in different ways. If you're studying graphic design, you could, and your letters are nice enough, you could turn them into font. Lots of type designers use type. Their type is based on a handwritten construct first. Um, you can do mural art. So there's, there's, there's tons of things. There, there are absolutely masses of things you can do. But how do you how do you go about doing it? So it depends on the field that you've decided to go into. 
for me when I was starting off and you know when I was starting off it, it, the internet was still quite young <laughs> um, and people really only communicated they just started communicating via email in more depth so I was in London I graduated from Rygate and um, I assumed that because I had a distinction and I was so good that I would get work and it doesn't work like that so I made up sample books and the sample books had an envelope with an address on it and an invitation. And I went around to all the PR companies, all the fashion houses, to see all, to all the event companies, all the printers, to see their marketing teams and people who would use calligraphy. And I sat there and this, this, took, this took months because you had to call and you had to hope to see somebody and then you get there and they're running late. And so, you know, it, it can be quite infuriating. Um, Whereas today, if you find somebody's email address, you can send them, send them some samples of your work by email, uh, or you can write them a letter, which is always more interesting because then they have something physical. Later on, I tended not to send physical samples because I had to pay for the ink and I had to pay for the paper and I had to pay for the postage. And if nothing came out of it, that, that was a loss. I mean, I'm talking about sending out, you know, like, a hundred things. So, you know, buying a hundred envelopes, really high quality envelopes where the envelopes are like, you know, one pound 20 because the paper is excellent mm -hmm. is, is an expensive venture. So try and figure out how you're going to connect with people in the industry that you want to work in. The next thing is you have to have a skill that they want. Don't just think because you could write pretty that somebody's going to want it. What do they want it for? So you have to figure out where is this skill applicable and are you good enough? This is a very tricky question, you know, because that is a tricky question. Some people can be very bad and they can be clear. Oh, I'm the best, you know, and at, at the same time, some people can be very good and they'll be like, oh, I'm not good enough. So this is very, very tricky. So let's let's sort of stick with the bread and butter work that most calligraphers tend to do, which is really either creating invitations, that's more sort of graphic design, or addressing envelopes. So if you're addressing envelopes, you need to know, you need at least 10 scripts. Because there's no point in offering addressing, envelope addressing service to someone and not having a range of scripts for them to choose from. You said 10 scripts? I offered 35. And those are only, those are only the simple scripts. That is, Copper plate script, Spencerian, Italic, um, variations of that, some 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 Kensington, and then we had seven um, we had seven simple scripts which were monoline scripts. What? Oh, and we had small caps. So so we had. Where's this book? Um, where's my style sheet? You seven different monoline scripts. Yes. Wait, I need, where can I, I need this, I need this. I will, I'll send you the PDF. Okay, that's not um, great. So, we, we had 12 formal scripts. We had seven monoline scripts. And then we had a further um, 10 or 12 mixed scripts. So, for instance, I would write the surname in large copper plate. And then I would write Mr. and Mrs. in small caps, and then the rest of the address in small capitals. But once you start blending scripts like that, they look really beautiful, but they're, they're a bit of a nightmare to do because you have to do the cop plate, set it aside, wait for it to dry, make sure you have the right name for the right address, and then go back in and fill all the rest of the text. And so it, it took longer, so it was more expensive. And then there were scripts that I had that I didn't offer to clients for envelope addressing, but you could use it for stationary design, you could use it for scrolls, things like textuals, quadrata, uh, formal Roman, rustics, unshells, you know, really complex scripts that you wouldn't, wouldn't really use for addressing envelopes because they take too long to do. So having a, a, a sort of range of scripts is really important. And you could have from messy scripts to really accurate scripts um, because some people might not want something that is accurate. And then, of course, with the advent of modern calligraphy, the structure of the script started to become a little bit looser, a little bit less formal. So having formal 
accurate traditional scripts and having slightly looser contemporary scripts, that's really important. I was fortunate that I'd sort of gotten out of the envelope addressing game by the time modern calligraphy was starting to kick in because I can do modern calligraphy, but my modern calligraphy doesn't look rough. It's very smooth and polished. There's no shaky hairlines because I'm using my muscular movement and whole arm movement to do the writing. I'm not just using finger movement. So my modern calligraphy is, is, is a slightly different sort of feel to it. There are lots of brides who like that sort of rougher look for their stationery. Um, and of course, you know, the, the other thing is you have to sort of cultivate your market. If you create a set of scripts, you also have to find the people who will like those scripts. So all of this is work that you have to sort of put in. Now, I'm, I'm going to sort of throw something else in here. And that is, don't think that you can just set up a business without any knowledge of a business. <laughs> If you have the time, do some business courses and some accounting courses so that it, it really helps you to understand how to bill, how to do your invoicing, how to add it to your taxes, because that is not a joke. And as calligraphers, invariably, we are really notoriously bad at doing our own accounting and and admin. And, and the admin is, is really important. You hire an accountant. I'm not doing my stuff. But you need a bookkeeper. What, what, what? You need somebody to manage all the little things. You know, when you're buying paper and place cards and, and you have lots of little things, you have to have some kind of system to keep track of your expenses, as well as some system to keep track of your income. That's not an accountant. Accountant takes all of that and does your taxes. So you might have a bookkeeper who does this for you, which is great. Um, Maybe. Maybe this is in the UK. My accountant does all the stuff. I don't know. Yeah, but, you know, some accountants do both and some accountants will not. Some accountants will require you to give them your monthly outgoings and incomings at the end of the month and then they tally it up and they sort out your taxes. Mm -hmm. That in the UK is a bookkeeper. A bookkeeper right. is different from an accountant because the accountant deals with more complex things. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, okay, we're talking about bookkeepers and accountants, but... If you decide to do this yourself, or even if you have a bookkeeper, you still need to keep the receipts. <laughs> and you still need you still need your personal card and your business card, and you don't mix them up. So little things like that that you just never really think about, they start to they become slightly problematic if you if you didn't incorporate them into your practice, into your business at the beginning. Yeah. Now, problem is. You mightn't have a business account because all you really have is your personal money. So you have to figure out how you're going to do that. You have to, I can't tell you how to do that. It's, it's entirely up to you. You either set aside X amount from your personal money to use it in your business, and then you pay yourself back once you've made that money, right? So, so there's, there's, there's lots of ways to, to work around this kind of account. There's tons of software as well um, that you can use. There's a great software called Zero. There's QuickBooks. So you can use these to help you manage your business. The next thing you have to remember is you are going to be working full time in your profession. That means you don't have holiday time because when you're on holiday, you're not making money. You're actually using money that you've made. So you have to build into your, into your year when you're going to take a holiday. And the only way to know that is to know when it's the busiest time. And if you are going to take a holiday, are you going to talk to people while you're on the holiday? So if the phone rings and a client says, oh, hi, are you going to take the call? Because you need to build downtime into your work. Otherwise, you will have burnout. And it's very easy to get to the point where you love the hobby. And it's not a hobby anymore. You're so busy doing the work that you forget that you need to take a break. And so at the end of the year, you're so frustrated, you, all your energy is used up and you cannot see the way forward. So this, this, this sounds like a phone call that Milen and I have had so many times, right? <laughs> so Milen is notoriously bad at working till three in the morning, waking up, not eating properly, 
just Go. driving himself crazy and he does it for you guys I just want to tell you since I've moved to Plovdiv I, I'm li- I'm a totally new person. First of all, I feel so happy. I'm I'm li- I'm I don't go to bed like after twelve or something like this. I wake up early, but yeah, that's my life. We had a lot of bad stuff. We do a lot for you guys, and we continue speaking about this topic next week. Thank you for watching, guys. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, feel free to DM Paul Antonio at PS Scribe or me, Milanist or... Oh, no, 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 no. Don't DM me. DM Milan. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. DM Paul. Just to Nips the podcast. <laughs> yeah. Nips the podcast. Follow on Instagram. Subscribe to the Nips podcast YouTube channel or wherever you are listening to this. Thank you for being part of this, guys. And as always, keep writing accurately. accurately.